Today's video is one of our all-time favorite videos by Carolyn Mize. It's a TED Talk she gives. It's 25 minutes long. I'll put the link to this Carolyn Mize's video uh, in the description. Uh, and, you know, if nothing else, really, it's a fantastic video. Really, really watch it. All right. And uh, this month of May, in my subscription group, we are tackling our weight loss journey. Now, this is it's called the Weight Loss Challenge. In fact, you can learn more about it if you go to www.weightlosschallenge.com. You can go check it out, www. Somebody put that in the comment section for me and I'll pop it up on the screen. www.weightlosschallenge.com. You can go look at it and, um, and read more about what the challenge is about. But we've never actually spent a month where we focused on weight loss. Now, this is not like your other things like you've done in the past, not like at work, you know, comment if you have like at work every spring, they always have some sort of weight loss challenge, you know, like uh, see who could lose the most weight or most fat percentage and you win like an iPod or <laughs> iPad or something like that. This is nothing like that. OK, what this is, what we're going to do <clears throat> is focus on honesty honesty okay so can you be honest about your weight loss journey so if you choose to join the challenge i'll do a post in our private group that says like um uh, what's your starting weight what's your highest weight you know what are your goals for this month and can you be honest and the key is the honesty so every week what do you weigh this week what did you weigh last week what did you weigh what do you weigh this week where did you mess up this is the first time and i've been doing this challenge for over two years now probably 26 months now so it's pretty crazy that we've never actually done uh focus on weight so at the end of the month there's not a, a war reward there's not a, not, not a physical reward right there's only the um the confidence and the uh, like that the feeling that you were honest the whole month you know you were honest about your struggles and you're honest about like what you did or didn't do what you said you were going to do and then didn't do hmm. comment if you're familiar with that so that's what we're going to talk about right now that's why today this is i know it's april 29th but this is actually the kickoff for may and so we got to start off with with this carolyn mize talk liars never heal so in this video she gives five five great life tips and they're all based around this okay choices all right and she says that's not working really well huh choices right we are born innately knowing that choices are powerful. Put choices in the comments section if you understand. Everything in your life, look around, look around. This house, this whiteboard, you know, uh, my studio setup, just, I'll, I'll just show y'all. <laughs> I, I am just radically transparent. So I'm gonna spin around. This is, I don't even play the piano, Not, it came with the house. This is my office, it's a mess. That's my guitar in the corner, I don't really play it. My stairwell, so this is my office, right? It's a nice room, it's a nice setup. Uh, but everything I have and you have in life is a result of the choices you've made. So write that down. For those of you taking notes, um, write that down. You know, you've got no, no one to blame. And what she says that's interesting is that we are born we are born knowing that choices are powerful, right? But here's what's important too. Hold on, let me get this right. Here's what's important. But somewhere along the, uh, the line, somewhere in our life, we have abdicated, write that down, abdicated the re, like our power over choice. Like we let other people, where do you want to go to dinner? Uh, whatever you want. You know, hey, where do you want to go on vacation? Uh, whatever you want to do when you really want to, you know, and your husband's like, okay, let's go camping. I want to go do some fly fishing. And you really wanted to go like to Tahiti or to Mexico, right? And you're like, okay, I guess I'll, I guess I'll put on my little waiter boots and, and like, t like try to catch a slimy fish. 
somewhere along the line in life, we abdicated our power of choice, right? This is super important that we understand this. And what I'm trying to teach you the next few days is that you got to take back that power. Okay. Choice is very powerful. So her five tips. Number one, choose to live an integrous life or live in integrity. Right? Choose to live in integrity. Like she says, forget about speaking your truth. <laughs> Just try telling the truth. Comment if you know someone like this, where like, ev like every other word out of their mouth is you're like, is that really what happened? Like you can't trust them. Like you don't really know what they're saying. Like you can't believe them. Do you know anyone like this? If you don't know anyone like this, it's you, okay? <laughs> They have a tendency to exaggerate. They exaggerate how much money they make. They exaggerate uh, how much money they won at the casino. They they uh, under under report how much money they lost. They exaggerate how stressed out they are. And um, you, you know these people like they'll tell you they were stuck in traffic for an hour when it was really only you know twenty minutes or ten minutes. Right? You know, <laughs> no, a ton of people like this. All right. Now, why is this important? It's because if you don't, if you live in integrity, then this, you can give up the need for lies. Life is so much easier when you don't have to lie, when you don't have to catch yourself. Did I say this? What was my excuse for not coming to work? What, what did I tell my husband I was going? <laughs> I'm out with the girls? <laughs> you know, and you might not be out with the girls. <laughs> Honey, I'm at, I'm at a church retreat. Okay. So life is so much easier and better when you don't have to try to remember lies, you know? And, you know, don't get me started on politics. I'm not political. I know some people think I might be. I'm not Democrat, I'm not liberal, I'm not Republican, I'm not anti-Trump, I'm not pro-Biden. I'm, Dude, I could care less about politics. Why? Fuckers lie. <laughs> the very nature of politics is to exaggerate your accomplishments and demean and diminish your opponent's uh, accomplishments. That alone is problematic for me. If you do good, watch this. If you do good, I say, way to go, girl. You did great. If I do good, I say, hey, here's exactly what I did. No more, no less. I've written 13 books. I'm not exaggerating. It's 13 books, right? I have online courses. I was broke at 39. I retired at 45. I'm radically transparent. I own eight cars. <laughs> I'm not even a car guy. Some of you guys watch it like, what the fuck? Why do you own eight cars? Like, <laughs> I was trying to get into classic cars to protect against inflation. And I realized I don't know shit about cars. Figured out pretty quickly after eight cars that, no. But I'm selling them in case you you want a 66 Thunderbird, let me know. Uh, interior is awesome. Could use the new paint job. So you want to live in integrity, okay? Um, and life will be a lot easier. You don't have to make up stories, all right? Now, why don't people do this? I want to write this in, in red because, you know, some a lot of your success is going to depend on your environment and your surroundings. So why, why do you put up with a friend or family member who exaggerate or lie or demean your accomplishments? Have you ever had this? You did something and someone else took credit for it. Comment if that's ever happened. And you're like, motherfucker, I did that. Like, what are you talking about? You didn't do that. Oh, but I kind of I helped out. Like, no, you poked your head in for a hot New York minute? Like, no. Okay. So why, why don't people live in integrity? It's easy to say, easy to say, hard to do. Okay. And here's the word. Here is the word. Integrity, humiliation. 
You can't live with the humiliation. They can't live with the humiliation, right? What if they found me out? What if my husband realized that I ran up $5,000 on the credit card? What if my family realized that we're living paycheck to paycheck? What would they say? What would they think? You know, what, what if my boss found out that I didn't complete the project? I didn't know what I was doing. What if my professor found out that I, I had to Google or I, I uh, plagiarized my paper? It's living with humiliation. Now, I will tell you this. What I learned from going through my rough times in 2008, so let me give you a little bit of my backstory. Some people are like, what the fuck? He like <laughs> so, you know, I never wanted to depend on medicine for my money. And, you know, when my dad immigrated and I immigrated from the United States, you know, to the United States from Vietnam, you know, he was 36, I was six, and we didn't know anybody. We were Vietnamese boat people. We were refugees. We stayed six months in Thailand, came to the United States. My dad was 36, I was six. And in 16 short years, at the age of 52, my dad retired independently wealthy. And he did that because he bought homes. He bought cheap homes and he repaired them and then he rented them out to Section 8. For those, that's uh, housing assistance, if you don't know what Section 8 is. And um, he paid off his mortgage. And by the time he was 52, he had like 25 homes. They were all debt free. They were all totally his paid off and he would collect. I mean, you do the math, $800 a month on average for these three. This was you know, 90, early nineties by this point. So like $800 times 25, you know, it's $20,500. If I did the math right in my head, like $20,000 a month, a month, uh, for a guy who came coming over 16 years earlier, couldn't speak English. And that's like, I have a 15 and a half year old. She's about to turn 16, Kizzy. She's in my book, Ultimate Gastric Sleep Success. So it goes by fast, right? Comment if 16 years goes by fast. You know what I'm talking about. Put 16 if you believe that 16 goes by so fast. Thank you, Anne. I appreciate that, right? Um, so I never wanted to depend on that. So when I was in residency for surgery, I was actually flipping houses and stuff, doing what my dad did. And I finished, I finished, re, I finished residency in 2005. I started my practice. And the next thing I, and um, I was buying real estate and I had beach houses because I never wanted this thing where I was dependent on my, my, um, my medicine for my money. So, and then 2008 happened. We know what happened in 2008, the real housing bubble, real estate bubble. And then for me in particular, I was in Galveston at the time and hurricane ike went right through my neighborhood tore up my rental houses i had an apartment complex i had a mobile home park i had an rv park i know dr v's crazy and um it was four million dollars worth of real estate which if anyone knows that's really means four million dollars worth of debt and uh, i couldn't operate for six months because the hospital i was at in the area several of them were like uh injured and you couldn't you know, once, you know, once the roof collapses on a hospital, you, you can't operate because it, you lose sterility in the OR. So, um, so I, I kept, you know, do you know this, this trick? You rob Peter to pay Paul, you borrow one line of credit to pay off another line of credit to pay off this and that and yada, yada, yada. And because of the 08 financial crisis, banks did not give any leniency. They wanted their mortgages. All right. And um, so I tried to, I struggled, try to keep it afloat for a couple of, uh, for two, three years, realized, dude, I can't do it. And eventually I closed down my little practice. I declared bankruptcy. I, um, and I couldn't say that until recently, the B word, <laughs> no, not bitch, bankruptcy. And um, I had to take this job in Illinois as like a small town surgeon. I was there for a couple of years and then eventually I became um, director of bariatrics in Albuquerque. And that's when for five years, like I, I wrote my 13 books, I developed the social media following, all that sort of stuff. And at the age of 45 in 2018, I retired, you know, I, I went from bankruptcy to retiring. Now that whole thing eventually cost me my first relationship uh, with Kizzy's mom. Uh, but now I have a new relationship with Erica and we have a five-year-old and I work an hour a day. I make more money now than I did as a surgeon. 
Um, so give it up for my dad, not for Dr. Reed, for my dad. And, and maybe, and, and I'm going to tell you the things I've learned was like, it was struggle. The struggle and I, looking back was because of this. I couldn't, I was too proud to ask for help. I didn't have any mentors because I was a surgeon. You know, I um, worked hard. I didn't have any friends. I had no one. I couldn't talk about it. I was humiliated. I let people down and, and I had to work through the process and I did it myself through meditation. I'm going to, we're going to talk about meditation the next couple of days, journaling. I dove into personal development, Jim Rohn, Les Brown, Tony Robbins, all of the greats, you name it, I've read it, right? And uh, what I realized was like my block, my financial block was I was still suffering from the effects of the bankruptcy of what happened to me in 2008 through 2010. And the realization that I let a lot of people down and I and I, and I borrowed money to pay one thing and just try it back and forth. So I had to have a radical humility in order to get rid of my humiliation, my fear of humiliation. And when I started saying the B word <laughs> bankruptcy last year, a couple of years ago, and that is when like I really flourished, you know? Um, so I no longer had to like feel when I met someone who was successful, I didn't feel like I was hiding. I, I had this friend and I, you know, I was, you know, he was a successful guy, owned 25, 26 businesses. And, uh, I was like, man, I, I have to sh tell you my story. And I told him the story and I said, and then I, and finally, first person I told him, I said the B word, I said, and then I had to declare bankruptcy and he goes, you declared bankruptcy? I said, yeah, I'm so embarrassed. I let people down. He goes, how many times? I said, what do you mean how many times? He goes, how many times did you declare bankruptcy? And I was like, once? He goes, oh, I've done it three times. <laughs> once is nothing. I've done it three times. I was like, you've done it three times? He goes, oh, yeah, my first business, I thought I was so good at it. I declared bankruptcy. So then I started my second business, and I thought I was all hot shit, declared bankruptcy. <laughs> my third business, uh, you know, I thought I really knew what I was doing this time. Bankrupted that one too. <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> so that when you give this shit up, this is like freedom. And in today's video, Carolyn Mize, which is the theme of our talk, liars never heal. Comment if you understand what I'm saying right? Never heal, but never heal in the comment section. If you understand that as long as you, as people keep telling lies, now I say people, I mean you motherfucker, as long as you keep telling little lies, you'll never heal. I, I would, I would never heal financially until I could admit that I let people down. Okay. You will never listen to me. I love you. Listen to me. Um, you will never lose the weight. If you won't be honest about your snacking, you're getting up in the middle of the night to look for food, you're eating on the way home. Trust me, I have taken care of thousands of bariatric patients. You will never heal as long as you're lying about what's going in your head and your heart, your marriage, right? Your, uh, your stress level. If you keep saying like, I'm so stressed out, but you're really not that stressed out, you'll never heal. If you keep saying like, I'm lazy, but you're, but you're working three jobs or I'll never make it, you know, you, you just won't heal. Okay. Um, I want you to write this down. I've never said this before. So <laughs> my people who are in my tribe, they know when I say, I've never said this before. It's a moment you want to write down. Okay. When I was going through my bankruptcy and the hard times and I, I started saying like, I can't, I can't do this. What if I fail? What if I'm humiliated? These words, you got, you guys know these negative words. I can't, I can't face another day. I can't face another banker. <laughs> you know, I can't, you know, I can't do this anymore. I can't. What I realized is I can't dot, dot, dot. 
uh, and all those words, I can't, you know, our opinions. Watch this, not conclusions. Is that good or what? Write that down, man. I can't is an opinion, not a conclusion. But so many people live their lives like, like the second they say I can't, it's like done. Like, oh, I can't do it. I can't pass a test. I can't handle another day. I can't, I, I hate, you know, I can't do this job. I, um, I can't handle my kids. I, I'm, I'm so stressed out. They think it's like, boom, set in stone. Right? And I'm telling you, it's not set in stone. It is not a conclusion. It is an opinion. Right? But here's what happens. It's a conclusion for you. In the moment, in the moment for you and only for you, it becomes true. That's good shit, right? Super important. So when you say, I can't lose weight, okay, that's your opinion that you've turned into a conclusion only for you. Not for your mom, not for your child, not for your daughter. Quit that shit. Quit passing that shit onto your daughter, your kids. It's only true for you. I, you know, making money's hard. That's an opinion that you've turned into a conclusion only for you. Good shit, right? Now the freedom happens when you realize you go, whoa, that's just an opinion. It's not a conclusion. And now you're free. Does that make sense? Yes? Give it up for Dr. B. I got to keep going on. Hold on. I'm going to erase this because I got five more shit to do. Hold on. Right? That's good shit right there, man. God dang. Dr. B should be charging for this. Oh, I am. <laughs> that's right. Oh, I am. Number two. Oh, that's number two. Okay, number two. She says... Choose, right? We're talking about the power of choice here. Choose to pass on the wisdom, not the woe, right? Choose to pass on the wisdom, not the woe. All right? Now, I'm going to spend some time on woe. Because I know people are like, oh, you should be positive, Dr. V. You don't need to talk about the negative shit. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yeah, Tony Robbins says, you, you don't go into the garden, meditate, and say, there are no weeds. There are no weeds. you got to say, there are fucking weeds. Let's take care of the weeds. So I'm going to spend some time on the woe. Because I'm going to call you out. You know, stop passing on the woe. You know, honey, like, we're all big boned. That's not true. I put y'all in a CAT scanner. You'll see how tiny your little bones are. Like, and you're just this big layer of fat. Like, no, it's not true. You know, we, all the women in our family just have big hips. No, mom, you do. Cause you keep eating powdered donuts for breakfast with your, but I have to have it with my coffee. Uh, that's only true for you. You don't have to have it. It's not true. It's an opinion. So make the choice to pass on the wisdom, not the, well, um, honey, like we're not those people. You know, those people that live in the fancy houses, that drive the fancy cars, that's not us. You know, oh, we're the, the, the meek will and shall inherit the earth. Dude, don't be twisting Bible verses. Not true. Has nothing to do with money, you know. That, that's not a reason to, to, to uh, stay poor. In fact, that means the humble. The humble will inherit the earth, not the poor. See, we twisted this shit. It's a power issue. Trust me. Don't get me started on religion. I'm not even religious. So, pass on the wisdom, not the woe. Now, comment who in your family who's willing to. I won't put. I won't put anybody up on the screen. Who in your family continues to pass on the woe? My question to you is this: Is it you? Are you the one who keeps trying to pass on the woe? 
who just thinks it's too hard to lose weight. You know, uh, the economy's bad. Like, who can make money? Who can afford a house in this uh, uh, market? Um, a lot of people. That's why. <laughs> that's why you have all of these bidding wars. That's why you, people are selling their houses 30, 40, 60,000 over asking price because there's plenty of people that can afford a house in this market. You can't. <laughs> Mom, <laughs> dad, you know, auntie. So choose to pass on the wisdom, not the woe. Now, write this down. There is a Mark Twain quote, my favorite Mark Twain quote. And I don't want to fuck it up. So I'm going to read it to you. Okay. I got my laptop here. Listen to how good this quote by Mark Twain is. Mark Twain said, I'm an old man and have known a great many troubles, but most of them have never happened. I'll read that again. Mark Twain. I am an old man and have known a great many troubles, but most of them never happen. In other words, the woe, our hardest times, our woe, happened inside our head. We made that shit up. We worried. We, we fret. What if this happens and that happens? What if Trump gets reelected? Oh my God. What if Biden gets reelected? Holy shit, then we'll be really screwed. What if like Russia invades Moldova? I don't know where the fuck Moldova is, but what if they invaded Moldova? You know, it's like, what? What are you worried about, man? You know, you're giving yourself insulin three times a day. What, what the hell do you care about Ukraine? You know, you got other problems. You know, you can't walk two blocks down the road. Your legs are swollen and you keep arguing for your Diet Cokes. You keep arguing that you can't drink water. You know, you're a stress anxiety ball. I give you the answer, which is meditation. And you say, oh, I can't do that. I mean, it's crazy, right? Stop it. Choose to pass on the wisdom, not the wealth. Now, if not for you, and for your kids, don't you be, I don't have kids, <laughs> nieces, nephews. I'm an only child. I have no nieces and nephews. You know, the, you know, spend a day at the elementary school reading to the kindergartners. Pass on the wisdom. You know, spend, spend, volunteer in a pediatric cancer ward. You'll understand. You'll understand the preciousness of life if you do that, you know. My pediatric surgery rotation women I had to take care of pediatric cancer patients. It's just like painful, wretch. I mean, I couldn't become a pediatric surgeon. It was just so painful, you know, to see these kids. So choose to pass on the wisdom. If nothing else, then just to stop the curse. Stop it. Stop it with the paycheck to paycheck, you know. Say, honey, daughter, you know, learning about money is important. Hey, guess what I've learned? I'm 70 years old, I'm broke, and it turns out this whole time, money is important. <laughs> oh, thanks, Grandpa. Thanks for telling me that now, right? So choose to pass on wisdom. I'm going to keep going here. This is good? Comment if this is helpful. Is this helpful? I want to know, right? And if, it's, if you find it helpful, just hit the share button real quick. And as always, I'll download this. I'll put it up on YouTube and so you can catch it, you know, the shorter version. Okay, number three, choose <laughs> to take risks. Choose to take risks. Jim Rohn says, you know, it's all risky. So people go, your, your, your friends, your loved ones will go, oh my God, that's so risky. Starting your own business, going back to school, you're a single mom. Actually, watch this. In the comment section, put something that you did that people said was too risky. You're too old. You're too young. You're moving across country. You're moving to another country. Like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do for a living? It's so risky. And Jim Rohn says, if you think, um, you know, risk, taking a risk is hard, wait till they give you the bill for not taking a risk. Uh, the cost 
of not taking a risk is much greater than taking the risk. Okay, so choose to take risk. Cost. Cost of not taking a risk is greater than taking the risk. Guarantee you 110%. I went through bankruptcy. It's $4 million in debt. 38, 39 years old, retired at 45. Now, some people will sit there and go, well, Dr. V, see, see, that's why I don't do it. No, you didn't hear it. The second part, retired at 45 and learned, no, integrity, don't lie, radical humility, transparent, transparent about my numbers. I don't have to, what did I say? What was the lie I told? No, nope. because liars never heal. I'm healed. I'm still healing, right? So take risk. Choose to take risk. It's risky regardless. Everybody, everybody um, has things like where ha have moments in life that you have to make a decision. I want to tell you, one of the riskiest things you ever did was to say, I do. Comment if you agree. Now, otherwise, did you guys realize that the, the divorce rate in America now is over 60%? 60%. So why are we still holding on to this idea that somehow you have to get married? That otherwise it's not a commitment. Like I've never been married. I was in my first relationship for 18 years. I'm going on seven years, almost seven years in my current relationship. We're not married. Like it's just not true. You know, people like t getting married is a huge financial risk, but that's why we're committed. If that was true, then why is the divorce rate 60%? And then some people get divorced the first time, and then they get divorced the second time, and then they'll they have that dacity to go, third time's the charm. And they're surrounded by people that go, yes, third time's the charm. Instead of people that go, mm, you sure you want to do that? <laughs> the first two didn't work out so well. How about you just kind of like date for a little bit? How about you just like chill out for a little bit? You know, take risks. Uh, having the baby. Now listen, lean back, right? Don't get all Jesus on me. I have no opinion on this, but I'm going to tell you, studies have shown that the younger a lady has her first baby, the further behind she is in life. Not that she can't make up for it. Not that she can't be successful. Not that she, not that that 16 year old mom can't go back, go to college or start her own business and, you know, become a success. On average, you are putting yourself way behind the sooner you have a baby. That's just the math. That's just the studies, right? So you have to make this choice. Do I have the baby? Do I not have the baby? And you have to be unemotional about it. It's very emotional trying to make these decisions to take a risk. Because some people, some people are like buying a new car, like stresses them out. Buying a new house stresses them out. I'm like, I buy a new car. I mean, like I said, I have eight cars. I buy a new car, car like it's, uh, you know, like people buy suits, you know. Um, so, so those of you who are new to me, like I'm, I'm buying this 1,600-acre ranch in New Mexico that I'm going to turn into a campsite, glamping campsite. Hope you'll come out and see my new ranch, you know. Um, I close at the end of this month. So by the time we wrap this up, I'll, I'll be closing. So, but I'm not emotional about it. I, I sit down. I calculate the risk. Here's my mortgage. Here's the insurance. Here's, you know, how much I'm going to owe and how much I got to make and employees, yada, 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 the cost of the equipment, supplies. Here's what I think I can get in terms of rents, etc. And you take the emotion out of it and it's better. Trust me, it's better. All right. So choose to take risk. Number four. <clears throat> this one's really important. Choose new words all right you got to choose new words you want your life to change guys choose new words okay i tell my tribe like there's there's only a few times in your life that really radically changes your life the thing that set me off on this path all right i was director of bariatrics in albuquerque the hospital system was in a big disarray because it had, the hospital system had split up from its physician group, so it had no providers, and that's how my position opened up. I interviewed, got the job. Uh, it was a hot mess, whatever. And so I'm meditating 
you know, several times a day, just trying to deal with the stress and lead and build, build back the team and, and train my nurses and staff and everything like that. Right. And I'm trying to be, I'm every, every eyes on this skinny Asian coming in to like run the bariatric program. So every, every eyes on me, very stressful. And, um, I'm meditating, meditating. And one day I come out of meditation and instead of trying to be the best or the most famous, or right all the time. I came out of meditation and it occurred to me, oh, like the heavens opened up. And I said, I'm going to be the world's happiest surgeon. Now, <laughs> for those of you know, uh, those of you who know surgeons, that's, that's a very low bar. <laughs> it's not like, I'm not like jumping through heaps, like, like, like straining my back, trying to become the world's happiest surgeon. That's not a high bar, right? <laughs> I was like, I think I can do this. I come out of meditation. I get ready. I show up to the hospital, right? Now imagine, how does the world's happiest surgeon walk? You know, most surgeons are like mm, walking all mad and angry, right? Well, the world's happiest surgeon, turns out he's kind of like, hey, what's up? You know, <laughs> so I start walking in the hospital. I do my little 70s strut. I'm kind of working it, right? Walking in. And my, um, I get to the OR suite and the nurse walks out and runs out in pre-op and holding, oh, Dr. V, Dr. V, like, I'm so sorry. Like we're running behind this and that happened. So what does a typical surgeon do? They would say, oh, why? Uh, you ruined my schedule. Like I'm behind now. Like, why don't y'all have this down? I've told y'all, right? The world's happiest surgeon turns out. I said, no worries. That's, these things happen. It'll give me time to go make rounds upstairs. How long do you need? Oh, 10 minutes and we'll have your patient. Oh, that's perfect. Doesn't matter if it was, if I needed more, didn't matter. I just, that's perfect. I'll be back in 10 minutes. So go upstairs, make rounds, come back down. Dr. V, we're ready. Go say hi to pay. the world's happiest surgeon. The new words I chose. Yeah. And then a couple more things that changed my life. Uh, mm, I'm meditating, I'm meditating, I'm meditating, right? <laughs> and then the word came out, like, I decided, I decided, I said, um, everybody loves Dr. V. Now, some people cringe at that thought. Everybody loves Dr. V. Like, wow, that's arrogant or conceited. Well, if you think about it, yeah, everybody loves Dr. V, trust me. Now, why would, why should everybody love Dr. V? Now, follow him follow me now. Well, that means I show up on time. I say what I'm going to do. I do what I'm going to say. I live in integrity. I pay back my debts, which is a lesson I learned from the past. I honor money. I am cautious, right? Everybody loves Dr. B, which means now I, I you know who likes to be told they're wrong. Nobody. So I quit criticizing. I only praise them for the good stuff. Like when they did something great, I was like, oh my God, that's awesome. You did a great job. Everybody wants attaboys and girls. Nobody wants to be told how they could do things better. It doesn't work that way. So I stopped criticizing, right? Why should everybody love Dr. B? I got your back. If I tell you I'm coming to your birthday party, I come to your birthday party. If I tell you I um, can't make it to whatever, I'll send you a gift. I'll send you a flower. If I'm coming over for dinner, I bring a bottle of wine, bouquet of roses, two bottles of wine, depends on the person, you know who you are, three bottles of wine. <laughs> you know, I'm not showing up empty handed, right? Um, if I know somebody, if I can help you, I'll try to help you. If I can't help you, but I know somebody, I'll make the introduction that I can help you. That's what it means when I say, everybody loves Dr. V. You have to become a person that's worth getting to know because you can't love me until you get to know me. So why would you want to get to know me? Because I bring value to your life. So you see the thinking here? Dr. V's not crazy, right? And then I start telling funny jokes. <laughs> you wanna hear You want to hear some funny jokes? I got jokes. You ready? I'll do some new ones. I'll do, I'll do, one, I'll do one for, uh, okay, Chris, no, I can't tell that one. <laughs> All right, uh, did you know, did you hear about the new restaurant on the moon? Yes, the, the food is really good, but no atmosphere. <laughs>
Come on. Did you hear about the new restaurant on the moon? Food's really good, but no atmosphere. <laughs> I told this joke a couple weeks ago. Do uh, do trees poop? Do tree poop? Do trees poop? Of course, trees poop. How else do we get number two pencils? <laughs> How else do we get number two pencils? <laughs> Come on, that's funny. <laughs> so when you decide to be the world's happiest surgeon and everybody loves Dr. V, you start trying to remember jokes. <laughs> Right? My God, there's so many of y'all watching. This is awesome. All right, so choose new words. Now, why, Dr. V? You know, I'm just a curmudgeon. I'm just who I am. You know, like, I don't know jokes. I have no sense of humor. Why should I choose new words? Here it is. Your, and when I say you, I mean me. I mean you, motherfucker, but me, but you don't mean. Your words are so Britney, song, Britney Spears song, man. Your words are like a Britney Spears song. They are so toxic. Can I have an amen? Can I have an amen if your words are so toxic? If you really had to be honest, the things you talk about yourself. Oh, you idiot. Oh, I'm so forgetful. Oh, I'm no good with money. Oh, I'm a stress ball. Oh, I can't handle this. Oh, like it's too hard, too difficult. Can I have an amen? Do you know these people? Do you know, are you, are you these people? Your words are toxic, right? Because somebody put that shit in your head. Somebody told you that. Somebody said that, right? <laughs> you know, it's like you need new words just to get rid of the toxicity. Does that make sense? And if you start to choose new words, now you don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have to lie. The toxic words are a lie. Ooh. You never heard me say that before, have you? You never heard your fucking therapist tell you that, right? Your therapist never said, you know, Mary, <laughs> these things you keep saying about yourself, they're lies. They're toxic. What do you mean they're lies? No, no. I really am a stress ball. No, Mary. You lack skills. You don't know how to solve that problem. You lack reading skills. You are unwilling to Google or YouTube it. No, it's my mom. No, no. You lack communication skills. Yeah. No, no. It's my kids. No, no. You lack parental skills. That's it. You know. So what happens is when your words are lies, you will never heal. Does that make sense? Because subconsciously, your subconscious knows that they're lies. Ah, uh, can I have an aha? No, Dr. B, I don't believe you. I am really stressed out. Okay, let me give you this. Who, who, whose image are you made in? <laughs> whose image are you made in? Well, I'm made in God's image. I'm made in Christ's image. I'm made in Mother Earth. I'm made in the universe, the, you know, the higher power, the almighty, whatever you call it. Allah, whatever you want to call it. Jehovah. I'm made in God's image. Let's just call it God's image for, for right now. I'm made in God's image. Really? So either you're... Your God made a mistake by making you, right? Or your God's not all powerful. Because if you're made in God's image, then you should be able to handle all this shit. Am I right? You're, why are you saying you're less than? Every time you say, I can't, I'm less than, I, I don't deserve it, you are, you are really cursing your God. I'm not religious, <laughs> you know? But really, you're, you're cursing your source. You're saying, source, I know better than you. Source, you made a mistake. See, and your subconscious knows this. Does this make sense? Oh, no, Dr. V. Like, we are born in original sin. No, the fuck you're not. You can't sit there and say, like, 
I'm made in the image of God and somehow I'm born in original sin. And then the fucking pastors and the priests like wrap it around. Well, oh no, that's why Jesus died on the cross for you. It's no, it's not true. I don't, I'm not, I'm not a biblical scholar. So give me, forgive me, but you get the idea. My point is your subconscious knows when you're lying, when you really could do it. You really could lose the weight. You really could give up the junk food. You really could drink more water. You really could put on shoes and go for a walk. But you don't. But you don't. Because your words are toxic. Right? That's the problem. That's the problem. So choose new words. And the last thing she says, number five, and we are done. Choose to bless your day. When you wake up, it's a blessing, right? You get to try it again. The, the, all the shit that happened yesterday, it's all gone. You get a brand new clean slate. You can choose to start off by bitching and moaning and complaining and sleeping in and, oh my God, it's Monday, I gotta go back to work. Oh my God. It's Tuesday. Well, this weekend, never, this week will never end. Oh my God, it's hump day. TJIF, it's Friday. See? Or you could wake up and be like, woo, another day above ground is a good day. <laughs> I get a whole new fresh start. Let's see if I can, let's just see how long I can go without fucking this up, right? You brush your teeth and you're like, oh my God, my hair is receding. Ah, damn it. <laughs> I fucked it up. Like, oh, I got crow's feet. When did that happen? Damn it. <laughs> you know, like how long can you go blessing your day? Now I'm going to tell you why this is important. This is super important. Okay. Whether you know it or not, listen to me. Stop what you're doing. Listen to me. This day, this moment will be the only time you will see this moment. You will never have it again. This is the only breakfast you'll have with your significant other. The only time you'll have with your kids. Why? Because tomorrow they'll be one day older. They'll be one day closer to death. They'll be different. They will have had a bully the day before and now they're scarred the next morning. You get the idea. Or you find out that they've been sexually abused by a neighbor next door. Now your next day is different. You find out your husband comes home and says, I got laid off. And now the breakfast the next morning is not the same breakfast. One of my favorite sayings is that a man or a woman, a man never crosses a river twice. Why? It's a different river. It's a different man. Because the river, as the river flows, it polishes the rocks, it tumbles, it causes erosion. So the river's never the same. Different fish run through it. There might, there might be a heavy rain and it floods its banks. It's a different river. But also, you're a different man. You're a different person. You've got life experiences. So this year, when you go to your favorite lake or your favorite beach or your favorite fishing spot, you carry with it the experiences of this past year and you're radically affected by it. Maybe you've grown, maybe you've lost weight, maybe you've gained weight from the pandemic. You're not the same. Maybe, maybe this year you're following um, a new cancer diagnosis. And next year, when you go back to the same river, maybe you're suffering from the uh, toxicity of chemotherapy. And then if you're lucky, maybe the third year, you're cancer free. You're not the same person, right? So in the moment, when you choose to bless the day, you realize this is the only time I will ever see my mom like this, my dad like this. Because at any moment, they could have a car wreck, they could have a cancer diagnosis, they could have a heart attack or a stroke, they could come down with COVID. You understand what I'm saying? It's really powerful. And the second you choose to bless the day, it sets up all of the other shit. When I choose to bless my day, 
I choose new words to describe myself. I choose to consider, consider and think about risks. I choose what parts, what wisdoms I want to give my, my kids instead of the woes. I choose to live in integrity, right? Because I'm using new words to describe myself. And literally, that's the healing process. Now, May is the first time we've ever focused on our weight. And I will tell you, another favorite saying of mine comes from a Buddhist teaching. Write this down. It says, obesity is nothing more than the manifestation of all of our suffering. Obesity is nothing more than the manifestation of all of our suffering. Liars never heal. Liars will continue to suffer. Liars will suffer and never be happy, never be satisfied, never be able to lose the weight. If you win the lottery, if you get a pay raise, if you get an insurance settlement, you will spend that money because you cannot live integrity with your money and your finances because you're constantly lying to yourself and your subconscious and your surroundings. Does this make sense? If you want more money, heal. If you want uh, to lose the weight, heal the past hurts. Quit blaming your mom or your dad. They did the best they knew how, man. Quit blaming your grandpa. They, he did the best he knew how. And it could have been horrible. I'm not trying to diminish it. You have to understand that. If you are willing to accept this premise, that obesity is nothing more than a manifestation of your suffering, that our life does not have to be suffering, that you can choose to change, then I invite you to join us tomorrow, same time. I'll do another talk. Follow me on my Facebook fan page if you want to see, like, what's the video for tomorrow that I'll be doing. And, and if you want to learn more about the challenge, I invite you right now. Go to www.weightlosschallenge.com. You can read what it's about. You can 